And now is the time to interview Peter Capitain. Uh, the interview in our ateliers is a format which is uh, done once during any every annual meeting with one of our most favorite guests. And Peter was a person, is a person who has sustainably contributed and supported our Biotech Atelier. And I have to start, Peter, thank you for being so a uh, good friend in the years for being so uh, always ready to support, always ready to contribute. And you are really, uh, I consider you as one of the founders of this event. <laughs> I have prepared for you uh, some questions. Some of them are provocative, but others are also contributive. So let me start with the first one. Is patient advocacy a gift or a job? Mm, it's a mission. Yes, it's a mission, but uh, being a mission, can this be, in a way, uh, also a job? You see, I'm a little bit reluctant in answering this question because um, 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 the moment it starts to become a job or a profession, um, you, 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 are, well, you are vulnerable in becoming a professional in a professional way. Uh, the discussion before, uh, what you saw, uh, not only in the words, but, but, but also in the eyes, uh, was uh, uh, an, an emotion. So being a patient advocate is always a combination of working with arguments based on science, knowledge, facts, but also the combination with emotions because you have to know why you are doing it. So. Um, it's a mission and, 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 and let's say, yes, it's a, a job, it's a profession, but please take care that you always be aware why you are doing it. Yes, exactly this why uh, was uh, the root of my question because uh, actually there are uh, a lot of patient advocacy groups in the world who became uh, almost the corporations. For example, um, what do you think about the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in the United States? They have invested 1.5 billion US dollars in drug development in the last 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that the patient advocacy group in Europe has the chance to become such huge and such influential? I don't think there are patient uh, groups that are able to invest so much money and, and I, I don't think it, it is. I don't think it's necessary for a patient organization to invest so much money because if if you are responsible for one point five billion, that brings in other uh, uh, interests as well. You have to take care of that money, and and uh, it's good to have one important interest as a patient organization, and that is the focus on the patient. What is good for the patient might not be good for the revenue and profit that you make with producing uh, uh, medicines. No, in principle, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is considered to be a non-profit organization. And uh, mm. uh, what they say is that they are investing in uh, drugs in order to make them more affordable for the patients and go out of this, this uh, business-oriented approach because you know very well as all other uh, patient advocates that some of the hurdles for early adoption of new drugs is the price. Yeah. And this is especially valid for uh, low and middle income countries where patient, uh, patients are struggling to get new treatment because of the price. And when you see some of the sp statements of also other patient advocacy groups, they say we prefer to invest and then not to look for the revenue, but look for uh, cheaper and more affordable drugs. Yeah. What do you think about this? Yes, that, I, I think that is that, that is very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, um, since a couple of months, I uh, uh, I work with a Dutch oncologist who um, came up with uh, for uh, came up with chlorambucil uh, as a medicine for treating BRCA mutated breast cancer. Um, and uh, it is a well known uh, uh, Dutch oncologist. Um, so. I immediately was interested in that because he said chlorambucil costs around 300 euros per patient per year. And it is as good as the PARP inhibitor Olaparib, 
which cost 36,000 euros per patient per year. Now, what is necessary to get Porembucil in the protocol? So, but because when it's in the protocol, it's, it, it can be prescribed and it is reimbursed. So I think there are good possibilities uh, to find good, safe and cheap medicines for patients who can treat breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, whatever cancer, you see. So it's very important that, uh, that we focus on that because there is, of course, not much revenue and profit in 300 euros per patient. And my statement, our statement from Inspire to Live, next week we'll send out an update on uh, uh, magistral preparation because these medicines can be made locally by the local pharmacy and when you do it via that principle, probably the cost of chlorembecil will be around, I don't know exactly, but let's say between 20 or 40 uh, euros per patient per year. And then it becomes affordable for low and middle income countries. So it is a very, very important. And maybe it is necessary that organizations like Inspire to Live immediately patent these medicines to prevent industry from uh, making a new patent and make chlorembucil as expensive, for example, as, 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 as Olaparib. We should be aware of that. There are, there are, very, there are many uh, examples of medicines that, were, that are good, safe and cheap that have been re-patented and are now very expensive. Yes, this was an excellent example. And uh, my next question is based on the statement of Dr. Sherlyn Badger that uh, experience is equal to evidence. Yeah. The medicine today is dominated uh, with a paradigm of evidence-based medicine and evidence-based data. Do you think that soon, uh, speaking about experience equal to evidence, that there will be a medicine which is called uh, patient experience-based medicine? That is, that is, the experience is evidence. I immediately wrote it down because I like these statements. It still resonates, but it probably also resonates in one year or a five year, etc. Like another statement based on evidence. Evidence is important, but not enough. That's what I heard another uh, physician say. So uh, I think it, it is the only way to go. My father was diagnosed with prostate cancer in a, in a ser serious way. Um, and uh, I always remember the statement of his physician who said, when I look at the data, there is not much wrong with your father, Peter. But when I look in the bed, I see a very sick person. So experience, real world evidence, etc., is necessary to say, hey, we see that this medicine works or that it doesn't work. I mean, it, 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 so I, I think... Um, it will probably take a generation before we we are used to use these words, but you see with personalized medicine, phase three randomized controlled trial, and be aware, Bettina Real, and I really admire her, has called RCTs are called by patient advocate randomized controlled terror, because it quite often um, uh, is not what is represented by patients group who are being treated. So looking at the way a medicine works in patients is very, very important. Here in the Netherlands, one of our, uh, one of our patient advocates is an anesthesiologist. He works with pancreatic cancer patients suffering from pain heavily, and he gets them all off opiates with lidocaine. Well, as you know, lidocaine is a very well-known medicine. It's good, it's safe, and it's very cheap. We, 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 mostly we say it's 10 euro per gallon. Um, um, so, and, and the, the big advantage, of course, the, the price, but also the big advantage of lidocaine is that the quality of life stays at a, at a good level, and where opiates, immediately decreases the quality of life. It takes away the pain, but it also decreases the quality of life. He has treated over 30 patients with lidocaine, Dimitar. And still we need a randomized controlled trial to prove it. I think that is not the way we should continue to go. Yes, that's a good, excellent answer to my question. And when you speak about the generation, I know that uh, 
in the human history generation means 20 to 30 years difference. Yes. Yeah. So I can recall uh, the first day of my uh, career as a physician. It was uh, 1989 and I started as a young gynecologist in a small city in Bulgaria. And at that time, uh, patient voice didn't matter at all. Nobody was paying attention to the patients. Now, today in Bulgaria, I can say that due to the efforts of Dr. Hasergiev and a few other colleagues, yeah. we have even a minister who is uh, coming from a patient advocacy group and patient voice in Bulgaria does matter. But where do you think the patient advocacy will be in another 30 years? Or no 30 years, let's say in 2030, because the other topic of our atelier is movement health 2030. Where do you think we will be patient advocacy group physicians and stakeholders in 10 years? First thing I hope they do not professionalize. Yeah. Where we started, <laughs> yes. <laughs> our talk um, uh, but but i think i, I think what, what you, of course you see an evolution and i always say it's going much too slow but you see an evolution where patients becoming more relevant in the discussion um, still be away from the, dis the decisions sometimes i get the example of the dutch ministry of health who has in the board a patient advocate who is part of the decision making process but that is still an exception but i think the evolution is towards more discussions at the at an equal level and at a high equal level but the patients are not dumb patients are very intelligent is part of the patient group is very intelligent they know what they're talking about so they become part of of, of the dis discussions first and then they are allowed and you have to fight your way into that position of being allowed to take a decision and well and and there will be differences here in the netherlands we are not that far yes the ministry of health but a lot of institutions do not have patient representatives in our in our uh, the, 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 let's say it's the dutch ema uh, uh, there is no patient representative no patient advocate there is a patient representative but that is a lawyer uh, there is no patient advocate in the in, in 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 the board they are discussing about risks that patients might uh, experience when new medicines are introduced but there is no patient in that discussion and they're talking about the risk that we have to take that is strange so i think if well it depends. In some some countries, you see, uh, uh, which are you could say early adopters, that will be in four, five, six years. They will be in boards, etc. Uh, and other countries have a little bit slower pace. But in the end, I think, uh, the, well, in the end, I, I'm, I'm of course I'm always hopeful. But in the end, I think patients will be not only have taking part in the discussions, but also in the decisions. And this there is, is really a great. Maybe yes, I can sorry, add sorry. Some, some. There is a very good example. In a way, you could say this has been done before in the in the early 90s when ACT UP, the HIV AIDS representative organization in the US, they worked very activistic. And and that is important. Pete, Peter Staley and, and Larry Kramer, the, 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 the founders of ACT UP, they were well respected by Tony Fauci, who was at that moment, he was already the, the, the director of, of, of the NIH. And seeing that documentary, I always uh, recall that doc, uh, how to survive a plague. Seeing that document, there is an interview with Fauci and he spoke in a very respectful way about these guys knew exactly what they were talking about and how we worked. And they are still closely related, at least Peter Staley, because Larry Kramer died a year ago. but but. So you, if you know what you're talking about, if you are very activistic, you will achieve the position at the table for discussion and decisions. Yes, excellent and very touching example uh, about uh, Antonio Fauci because now he's playing also a crucial role in the COVID fight. You know, um, what do you think about the position of chief patient uh, patients officer in big pharma and big uh, med, tech, med tech companies? 
well, if I, if I, if I say that, that you should be part of the discussion and part of the decision, that is a good thing that in the boards of, of, of uh, uh, industry, there should be representatives of patients, as there should be in the board of Ministry of Health, or I think that in the board of four or five people of hospitals, there should be a patient advocate. I think that the, the decision will become at a higher level and more patient focused. But is this not a way to count out patient advocacy groups if you have an employee in Pfizer, for example, or another big pharma company who is uh, called chief patient officer, who is liaising in the way uh, yeah. with patient organizations? But uh, is this not a way to count them down or make them more, um, let's say, contributive? Of course, that that, that danger is, is 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 present. Yeah, absolutely. But 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 I think, well. Like, like I stated in, in, in the panel discussion, it brings in responsibilities for uh, patient advocates in, uh, in, the whole, uh, uh, um, in the whole discussion about what is needed for patients to reach better treatments, better quality of life. And industry plays an important part, a very important part, bringing, for example, medicines, but also medical equipment, etc., to to hospitals, to patients, etc. So if that is an important part in the whole uh, uh, field, you cannot walk away from your responsibility. And then you have to take care of checks and balances that you are not uh, uh, calming down by, uh, by, by the interests of industry that can be done. Yes, there is a danger, but it can be done. A good example. The entire talk today uh, was in a way centered on oncology and patient advocacy in oncology. But what do you think about patient advocacy and personalized medicine in other disciplines? Like for example, the neurology, psychiatry, colorectal and so on. Yeah. Well, I don't think there is very much, there should be very much different. At the end, it is represent, uh, it is advocate. And I already gave the example of the HIV AIDS coalition. I have learned a lot. Our organization, Inspire to Live, has learned a lot. We cooperated with three years with uh, Dr. Joop Lange, who was a very famous HIV and AIDS re uh, uh, researcher and clinician who died in the MH17 crash. But until July 17, 2014, we cooperated with him and we learned a lot from him. And I do not know much about psychiatry or, or cystic fibrosis, the example that you gave. Uh, but I think the advocacy for patients in the end is, well, well, I can make that statement. I think in the end, it's, it's the same in all the expertises. Yeah. Um, you are chairing an organization which is called Inspire to Live. And I think that there is no better slogan for a patient organization how do you came to this name peter well i found it inspired to live uh, with a very crazy guy uh, who was very inspirational and creative and the, the well you could say we, you could say the, the 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 first initiative that we took was uh, uh called al which is is, is 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 funny when you know the dutch language but we climbed up a mountain six times on one day and as you know dimitar you cannot climb mountains in the Netherlands, so you have to go. Yes. To other, <laughs> you have to go to other countries. We went to France and we climbed up Mount Albuquerque, and we, we 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 raised funds for cancer research, enormous funds. Uh, we started with three hundred fifty thousand euros in two thousand and six, and then in two thousand and twelve, which was more or less the last year that I was part of the organization, we raised in one year thirty two million. And that guy that I found at first, I'll possess and later inspired to live. Um, well, like I said, a very inspirational guy. And 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 well, in the end, it is not like in the end, it is not about research. It's not about treatments. It's not about data. In the end, it's about quality of life. That is important. All people should become 87 years old. That's my statement. My grandfather died at that age, uh, with a good quality of life. Uh, until his last day, he passed away in his sleep. So everybody should become 87 years old, but with a good and with a good quality of life. So that is why we call it Inspire to Live. Yeah. So that's um, really an inspirational talk about Inspire to Live. <laughs> and if you say you cannot uh, uh, 
climb mountains in Netherlands. What can you do as a patient advocate in Netherlands? <laughs> well, we have a lot of water, so you can, at least you can swim. <laughs> Uh, what I can recall from uh, my stay in Netherlands was, it was a long time ago, uh, a Dutch guy described his country as water, grass and hoyer. <laughs> water, <laughs> grass and then cows. Uh, and um, I can say that I personally admire Netherlands for the care uh, which is expressed there towards patients and uh, we have uh, we can to, to learn we can learn a lot from netherlands and from other countries in uh, western europe uh, while bulgaria and the former eastern european countries have to catch up a lot so now in order to uh, give a short comfort break for everybody I, I would like to thank you for this interview and I have to admit to the audience that you are one of the few persons I have interviewed who didn't got the questions in advance. So uh, your comment on my questions is really amazing, uh, which, see, which says to me that you are in a way swimming in well-known waters. Um, I wish you good luck and also great success of Inspire to Live, which is an organization we would like to have always uh, as a partner in the Biotech Atelier. Thank you once again for your sustainable support and hope to see you soon in person. After yes, this let's, is let's, gone. let's make that agreement that next year we will be with a, uh, with, a, with a small group in Sofia again, like we were two years ago. So we are expecting you and we can uh, offer probably new interesting things for you in Sofia. Yeah. Uh, take care on you on, and on all, all your colleagues and thank you very much once again. My pleasure, Dimitar. Bye-bye. I would like to also thank you, the panelists of this morning session, and we're continuing after 10 minutes with a keynote by Dr. Burian Alexeva, who will present a website uh, that is dedicated to patients, so stay tuned.